hear God's word. And uh, so will you welcome with me Father Mark Sanzi. Let me just get set up a little bit. I'm pretty loud, so while I'm doing that, I'll, I'll talk anyway. Just like to thank Pastor Dave for inviting me to come over. It's always nice to come across the street, see what's going on on the other, on the other side of the street. The, um, I, I was at a church in Fort Pierce when I was up there for 10 years, and the Lutheran pastor there invited me to come to his church. And I told the folks there in the, in the congregation, I was standing, uh, I used to help out at St. Anastasia in Fort Pierce before I came down to St. Lucie. And I was standing outside St. Anastasia one morning and a lady came out and said, Father, my husband always enjoys your homilies. And I said, well, thank you. She said, he's a Lutheran. <laughs> I said, we'll pray for him. <laughs> I'm originally, as most people my age and older, I wasn't born in Florida. I'm uh, originally from upstate New York, specifically Buffalo, western New York, um, a baby boomer, and I was telling David that when I grew up, ironically, my home parish was St. Andrew. So I went to St. Andrew Parish, I went to St. Andrew Elementary School, graduated from there, went on to a local Catholic high school where we were staffed by Franciscan friars. That was the connection. I became close to them. And, they uh, made it attractive enough that I wanted to join them afterwards. So once I graduated from high school, I went off and, at 18 and joined the Franciscans. And when you join the Franciscans at that time, the first year of uh, your preparation is you go to a place called Novitiate. And it's, a, it's for novices. And um, you spend a whole year before you do anything else learning what it means to be a Franciscan. And you're invested in the habit, which is what I'm wearing, and I'll explain a little bit more about that in a few minutes. And um, so that whole year we were taught all about St. Francis and, you know, basic Catholicism that maybe we didn't understand completely. And, and we used to refer to it as boot camp because they literally taught us how to make our beds, how to set the table, what, how, what the proper way to eat, what fork to use, what knife to use, what glass to use, so that we would look like we knew what we were doing when we were finally finished with our formation. And then our formation after that goes on to college seminary in those days and then to theology studies and 10 years after you start if you if you survive and if you persevere you're ordained a priest and that's what happened to me in 1978 10 years later and because at that time our friars were staffing a number of high schools um, most of the time the newly ordained the younger friars were sent to teach in the high schools so um, I remember the provincial who was like the local superior said, what would you like to do after ordination? I said, I'd like to go to a parish. And this is when I learned the vow of obedience. He said, I'd like to send you to a high school. <laughs> <laughs> I said, okay, I'll go to a high school. And um, I spent 20 years teaching in high school because I, lo I loved it. So <laughs> Sometimes obedience works the way it's supposed to. And then after that, basically, I began working in parishes. And the first parish I was in was St. Mark's in Boynton Beach. And I spent eight years there, and I'm now in my 11th year at St. Lucy. So it's kind of rounding out almost to 20 years in high school and probably about 20 years in parishes, and then God only knows what's after that. But I said that I'm, will, I'm willing to stay a little longer. I can, I can tough. The people there are tough, but I can handle them. <laughs> a couple of them are sitting right in front of us here. <laughs> they're, the, they're local spies, so... You, you probably know who they are. <laughs> I'm also, at, when I was at, uh, being at St. Lucie, I realized that there's connections. We have a number of people, you know, we have marriages between St. Lucie and St. Andrew. Some families are the husband's Catholic and the wife is Lutheran, the, the wife is Lutheran, the husband's Catholic. So going back and forth. And when I first got here, one of the ladies who counts money for us on, on Monday mornings was Kit Limburger. And um, she introduced me to her husband, Tom. And we were talking, and, I, and she told me Tom had a background in finance. And I said, well, that's great. And I was thinking, and I, ver I verbally blurted it out. I said, Tom, would you like to be on our finance committee? And he looked at me and he said, Father, I'm a Lutheran. <laughs> <laughs> a Lutheran? <laughs> I said, you look normal. I can't understand. <laughs> and uh, I said, would you, I would still like you to be on our finance committee. 
I said, because you don't have to be Catholic to count money. <laughs> and I said, sometimes it's good to get a, you know, um, an approach from, you know, from the other side, too. I mean, you know, different things different, that happens in different places. And I said, I, I'm asking you because of your financial background, not of, because of your religious beliefs. But anyway, so it's been a, you know, a wonderful place over there. As you probably know, St. Lucie is a big parish. We have about th over, a little over 3,000 families registered over at St. Lucie. Um, on any given weekend, we have six masses. We have one vigil mass on Saturday, three Sunday morning masses, then two Sunday evening masses. All of those are in English except for the last mass at 7 o'clock, which is in Spanish. And the opening song that we did, Blessed Be the Lord, we oftentimes do that at our 5 o'clock mass because we call that the Life Teen Mass. And we have drums and guitars and all that. So, you know, it's really not that much different, folks. <laughs> it really isn't, you know, when you think about it. We'll talk a little bit more about that. But then I, I was going to say a little bit about St. Francis and who Franciscans are. St. Francis lived about 800 years ago. 1182 he was born in a little town outside of Rome, about three hours north of Rome, called Assisi. And um, if you go there today, it's almost exactly the way it was 800 years ago. It's a great place. And if you go there, you get to see where Francis was born, where he was baptized, where he lived, where he began this community of Franciscans, which he had no idea about starting. It was not his desire to do that. He wanted to be a knight, and he was a knight. Um, Assisi was like a little city-state. The ne neighboring state was Perugia. They were always fighting with each other. He was in a battle one day with them, was captured, imprisoned, um, spent about a year in the prison over there, and I think his father, because they were wealthy, his father ransomed him out. When he came out, he was sick. He spent some year in a recuperation, and during that time, he went down to a little church outside the town, and it was all crumbling. There was no roof. The walls were kind of falling apart, and he stopped there to say some prayers. The cross was still there with the image of Jesus on it, and um, he heard the cross say to him, Francis, repair my church. And he thought, well, no roof, walls are falling down. You know, he took it literally and he started to rebuild that church. Some of his friends wondered what happened to him. They found him down there and said, what the heck are you doing? And he said, told them all about it and they said, well, help. More and more people saw what these young were doing, men were doing. They joined in and they literally started to rebuild this church. And then he realized that it wasn't just the physical church, that the message was given was to the whole church. Because at that time, there were a lot of abuses going on. A lot of the clergy were wealthy, and they were very um, separated, distant from the poor in the community. And Francis didn't like that. He, you know, he said he wanted the, his men to minister to the poor, not to be caught up in this wealthy church that was so separated from the common people. So the other guys that were with him, they wanted to do the same thing. They wanted to pray together. And so they thought, well, once they've started accumulating more people, more people, more people. They said, we have to put some organization to this, so let's, let's form a little community, a religious community. They went down to Rome, got the approval of the Pope, and they said, but we don't want to be monks like we have now. We don't want to be in a monastery. We don't want to be locked up all day. We want to be out with the people, but we want to live together, pray together, eat together, but we don't want to be diocesan, secular clergy under the bishops. We want something in between. And the Pope liked the idea, gave him the approval, and then the, what we call the mendicant orders were founded. Mendicant coming from a Latin word meaning to beg. You would work and beg for your sustenance, food, money, whatever you needed. So the Franciscans were founded at that time, the Dominicans, the Augustinians, the Carmelites, all similar communities but founded by different people with a different charism. And so you could say that St. Francis was a reformer. And uh, someone asked me at the earlier services, why are you dressed like that? I said, it's not Halloween, it's not, it's not why I'm dressed like this. I said, this is basically what the clothing were the, the, the poor people wore. They just wore a tunic and maybe a, another cape or something on top with the hoods for the cold weather. Rich people had leather belts, poor people used rope. So St. Francis said, we're going to dress like the poor. And then the three, the three knots, which I forgot to describe in the uh, first services, stand for the vows that we take as Franciscans, poverty, chastity, and obedience to remind us every day of why, we, um, why we're dressed this way and why we have this cord. And I said, this is liturgical dress. You know, as I said, if you see me walking in the morning going down Prima Vista, if you bump into me at CVS or Publix, I won't be dressed like this. <laughs> and it's funny, too, because even our own, our own parishioners have to do a double take. You look familiar. <laughs> I said, so do you. <laughs> then I'll say, where do you go to church? Oh, Father, how are you? <laughs> They're nice people. <laughs> so in 
So St. Francis was a reformer. He wanted to reform the church at that time, so I thought that kind of fit in with Reformation, Reformation Sunday. I was telling Dave, though, the opening song at the first service was, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. I said, we don't sing that very often in the Catholic Church. <laughs> it was written by Martin Luther. <laughs> but, you know, many of the things that Luther wanted in those 95 theses were eventually brought into the Catholic Church because just about 20 or 30 years later at the Council of Trent they implemented a lot of those things. So he did have an influence even on, you know, on Roman Catholicism. And the different councils that we've had throughout the years basically have done the same thing. They've tried to bring the church up to date on certain things, change things where things needed to be changed, but always maintaining the, you know, the principle that we all have, that our faith is based on Jesus Christ. It's not on all the differences, it's on the similarities. And I know a lot of times, I don't know how much you know, I don't know how much the Catholics know, but our services in many ways can be very similar. As I said, we sing the same opening song. We read the same scriptures. We usually do an Old Testament, New Testament, Gospel at our readings. We have a greeting of the people. We greet one another. We say the, you know, we hold hands and sing the Lord's Prayer, or we don't sing it usually. We say the Lord's Prayer together. Um, so we have, you know, we have communion all the time. You have a communion on certain occasions. But I mean, there's a lot of differences in dogma and tradition, but there's more similarities than there are differences. We have had, a, it happen, has happened to me two or three times that I can recall that parishioners will come into church and say, Father, we went to the Anglican church for a couple of months before we realized it wasn't Catholic. <laughs> so, because it's very similar to Catholicism. You know, the mass is the same, the vestments are the same. So I said, you know, most of, those, most of the differences weren't with the liturgy, it was with other things. So when you go to these services, you know, we can sing your songs, the closing song at the opening sir at the early service was praise to the lord that was the first song that was sung at my ordination that was the that was the processional song so i mean every time i hear that i think of that day so i was thinking of my ordination at the at the morning service because that's the same song we sung that day so all those things are to bring us together we we need to remember what's common to our faith not what's different even pope francis i think is trying to do that too you know and uh He's trying to have a greater focus on the poor and those who are marginalized, to try to bring them back into mainstream Catholicism and let them know that they're welcome into, you know, into church, into worship, that God loves them too, he loves everybody. <clears throat> Supposedly, the story that was told that when the cardinals were voting for a new pope, they all meet in the Sistine Chapel and they set up these, <clears throat> excuse me, rows of tables and chairs and the pope and the cardinals are all sitting next to each other and as they're voting, Eventually, you can kind of see which way the votes are going, who's, a, who's likely to be elected. And when it looked like Jorge Bergoglio was going to be elected, the car, supposedly the cardinal that was sitting next to him leaned over and said, remember the poor, remember the poor. And then when he was elected, one of the first things they asked him, do you accept the election? He did. They said, how will you be called? He said, Francis. First time anybody said Francis in 200 and some popes. Because he wants to have care for the poor. So I think that's, you know, so we're so much like that. You know, we're all trying to do that. We're all trying to reform ourselves. We all have to reform ourselves. Faith is a constant reformation, changing your ways, hopefully making your ways better, and um, recognizing who we are. The faith in Jesus Christ is essential to both of us, to all of us, and how we practice it and how we, you know, celebrate it. Some of those things are minor, different, minor differences, more in common than we have separate. David mentioned about the scriptures, <clears throat> excuse me, that, you know, scriptures, we, have this, we share the same scriptures. You know, the Bible is the Bible. We have a couple different books that, are, you know, vary. Some of the canon of scriptures are a little different, but, you know, a little bit different is okay. But I always think the scriptures always speak to us, and they speak to us in different ways. They speak to us depending on what day of the week it is, depending what our attitude is that day. Are you in a good mood? Or are you in a bad mood? Or did you just have a fight with somebody at home? Are you thinking about, the, you know, your problems that you have? Is it a, are you young, are you old, are you somewhere in between, are you hearing these scriptures on Sunday, is it a funeral, is it a wedding? It all depends on how that scripture hits you that day because I think scriptures are alive. And the verse that hits you one day doesn't hit you maybe another day. So I always try to read the scriptures and think, what strikes me, what jumps out? And the one from Jeremiah this morning, this is the verse that kind of jumped out in my head. It said, I will put my law in their minds and write it in their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. I thought the most important parts, you know, the law, the law is something to write on your heart, not to be necessarily in stone someplace. And when we observe the laws that the Lord gives to us, we are his people, he is our God. 
And you know, I, was, I thought one of the most interesting things about the Ten Commandments was up until that time, the Jewish people really didn't know what God wanted them to do. So when the Ten Commandments came out, they were happy. Now we know what he wants. Now we can live our lives knowing we're doing what God wants. One of the unfortunate things might be that they're scribes and Pharisees, and Jesus always was contending with them. They took those Ten Commandments and said, we're going to show you how you can practice these Ten Commandments. We're going to come up with some laws. They came up with over 600. And Jesus said to them, you know, that's why he was always saying, you know, you, you're so caught up in the law that you're not, you're forgetting the heart. You know, faith is something you carry in your heart. You don't carry it in the law. You don't, you're, you're afraid you're going to break the law. You just don't want to break your heart or break somebody else's heart. And faith motivates you to do the good things that you're supposed to do, to try to live the way Jesus wanted us to live so that we can all share this life with one another, enjoy this life, and live happily forever with him in heaven after it's all over. So I think that's the most important thing, you know, to remember to love your neighbor. You know, our scriptures, the scriptures that we read on Sunday, as I said, are very similar. All, usually they're always the same. Now, your scriptures are a little different today because it's Reformation Sunday. But over across the street, they're hearing, what is the greatest commandment? You know, and they, Jesus responds, love the Lord with all your heart, mind, and soul. Love your neighbor as yourself. You can't separate those two. That's how you show your faith, by your love for one another. How that, that's what Jesus demonstrated, his love, because he created this earth out of love. He created us out of love. He loves all of us. Sometimes we have difficulty loving each other. And that's why I said to myself, you know, that person that you have difficulty loving, Jesus loves. So how do you, you know, how do you not look for the good in that person? And I think that's what we're supposed to do. Look for the good. So if you look for the good, you'll find it. If you look for the bad, you'll probably find it too. Sometimes it depends how you're looking and what you want to see. And we can always see something good in somebody. And it's funny sometimes too when you, you, know, you talk to somebody, they'll say, but you didn't know that person does this. Because we don't always know what everybody does. Sometimes people do things in secret that are wonderful. And sometimes we, don't just, we just don't know it. So we always have to give them the benefit of the doubt. I say I like the gospel too because it said, John says in the gospel, if you hold my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Free to do what God wants us to do. Not free to do whatever you want to do, but to have the freedom to make that choice for God. God gives us the freedom to make the choice. How are you going to live this life? Which, and even in what tradition are you going to live this life? And I love the Gospels that talk about the disciples and the apostles because they were human beings and we've heard about it all the time. You know, St. Thomas was that one that was doubting the Lord. St. Peter... St. Peter denied the Lord three times. St. Peter didn't understand what Jesus was doing at the Last Supper when he says, I'm going to wash your feet. Oh, no, never, never, Lord, you're never going to wash my feet. He said, if you don't wash my feet, if I don't wash your feet, you're not one of my disciples because I'm giving you an example of what you are to do. And then Peter, in his craziness, says, okay, I want my hands washed, I want my head washed. He said, Peter, I'm not going to give you a shower, I'm going to wash your feet. And this is what you're supposed to do. So I think and that's the whole idea about faith, <clears throat> following what the Lord did, follow, following what the Lord wants us to do, and following it because we want to and we can and we're free to choose, to choose that. So choose the Lord, choose to follow him, be a faithful follower, whether you're Catholic, whether you're Jewish, whether you're Lutheran or Methodist or whatever you are, follow the Lord. I'll just tell one little story and then I'll sit down, <laughs> hopefully for you. <laughs> but it's about a student that I taught when I was teaching in Buffalo, his name was Matt nicest kid and he wasn't the brightest kid in the class but he was one of the nicest kids in the class and he was involved in everything he ran cross country he was all, in all the school plays he was in student government he was you know just a general all around good kid came from a very traditional Irish Catholic family you know Catholic from day one they could probably trace their roots back to Jesus and uh, he, he uh, met a girl who was an Irish Catholic girl and she could trace her roots back to the Blessed Mother. <laughs> Even though you really can't because she didn't have any other children. Anyway, the um, they, two of them were just nice people. They were friends in high school, high school sweethearts. They got married, you know, about four or five years after high school. I officiated at their wedding. Three beautiful children. I baptized all the kids. Bought a house in the suburbs. Both had good jobs. Everything was great. Life was good. And the people next door to them were Baptist. Yeah, Baptists. <laughs> and every week they invited them to come to their church. Come to our church. Come with us. Come pray with us. And they said, no, no, we're Catholic. 
every week. They didn't, that didn't deter them. Come back. Come with us. You're, we want you to come to church with us. Finally, they said, we'll come. They got to the Baptist church. They were welcomed with open arms. They were made to feel like, you know, the people have been waiting for them to show up for all their lives. They were fit right in. They said, you know, the kids can go to, you know, scripture class and they can go to pre-k whatever and you know we are welcome and oh my god they said that we never felt so welcome in our lives they stopped going to saint peter and paul catholic church and started going to the baptist church and you know what that's like for a catholic going to the dark side <laughs> it was like you're doing what <laughs> and matt's mother was beside herself she told me and this was, of course, years after I taught him, but we stayed together. Can we stay connected? She said, Father, I'm devastated. I can't believe that they're going to the Baptist church. She said, we're Catholic. She said, and I thought this was great. She says, Catholic is who we are. And I thought, what a, I mean, what a testament to her faith. I'm a Catholic. I'm always going to be a Catholic. I'm going to die a Catholic. I was born, and she was born a Catholic. She was baptized before she was born. She, I'm... <laughs> She, uh, she said, we are going to be Catholic. And I said, well, you know, her name is Noreen. I said, Noreen, you know, just you know, don't have a heart attack or a stroke over this. Let them explore this a little bit. And so let's see where it goes. Don't, you know, don't write them off. Don't, he said, she said, every time they get, Matt told me this, every time we get together, she, Father, she's all over me because of this going to the Baptist church. I said, Matt, your mother is going to be all over you. As long as you're going to the Baptist church, you're going to have to get, deal with that. But she's still your mother. You're still her son. Don't let this split the family up. I hate to see family split up over religion. You know, the Baptists believe in Jesus Christ too. After about a year, they came back. And I think they realized that they, you know, they were so ingrained in that. But it was a wonderful experience for them. They got to meet, you know, another way of celebrating, you know, their faith. And um, in some ways, they might be even stronger now. And... Um, Matty, Matt even ended up sending his, his boys to Catholic high school too. And one, his one son said, Dad, I want to go to St. Francis High School, which is where I taught, where his father went. And that was not Matt's plan, because Matt is a teacher in the public school system. But Matt said, I'm so surprised. And then he went to Catholic high school, his brother, and his brother wanted to go to the Catholic high school. They're all doing fine. I said, but you know, the example I, I gave to him at that time when he was at the Baptist church is if you're going to be a Baptist, just be the best Baptist you can be. And if you're going to be a Catholic, be the best Catholic you can be. If you're going to be a Lutheran, be the best Lutheran you can be. Because that's who we are. We feel that's the way God has called us. And it's okay to, you know, it's okay for sometimes for our folks to come over here. It's okay for you folks to come over there. I remember, remember David that one Thanksgiving, David called me up a couple, about a week or two before Thanksgiving. He said, do you want to get our two churches together for a Thanksgiving service? I said, I said, David, I'm having a parish council meeting tonight. Let me ask them. So I mentioned it at the parish council. Nothing against you guys. I said, but do you want to get together with the Lutheran Church for a, a service the day before Thanksgiving? They said, you know, Father, Thanksgiving evening, we're all getting things ready. We're setting tables and cooking and all this stuff. And we have a mass at 9 o'clock every Thanksgiving morning that's very well attended. We get about 500 people at that mass. And they said, we like to go to mass on Thanksgiving morning. So... Let's just keep it that way. And we know nothing against, you know, the Lutherans. So I called David up and said, David, they voted no. <laughs> and that's what we both did. We both just started laughing. <laughs> and then David said, maybe I'll just tell our folks to come over for Mass. <laughs> I said, that would be fine. They'd be most welcome. I think that's the way it should be. We're honest with each other. We're open to each other. And we want to share our faith with one another. So the last thing I'll have to say is when St. Francis was dying, by this time, it was like 17 years after this group got together, there were a number of friars all around him, couldn't believe that this was, you know, the end of the man who started this whole thing. And uh, he looked up at the friars and he said, I have done what was mine to do. May Christ teach you yours. I think that's a great message for all of us. I have done what Christ asked me to do. May Christ teach you yours. So thank you for having me, and God bless you. And Come on over across the street sometime. <laughs>